Welcome to the show. I'm Carl Azus. Two days ago, we took you around the world to show you where different nations are in their responses to coronavirus. We're doing the same thing today, but for North America, and as you'll see, different locations' plans are just as varied. The new coronavirus that changed our way of life may become a long-term problem, part of a number of viruses, like the flu, that circulate around the world every year. That's the word from an official with the World Health Organization who says he doesn't think anyone can predict when or if the disease will disappear. The WHO is part of the United Nations. It was criticized for waiting until mid-March to officially declare the coronavirus a pandemic, a disease that's widespread across the world. Now the organization says there's a long way to go until it's not considered a pandemic. The shutdowns and closures related to the disease are increasingly being lifted, and there's hope in the efforts being made around the world to find ways to treat, cure, and prevent the disease. According to Johns Hopkins University, there have been more than 83,000 deaths linked to coronavirus in the United States, but there have been hundreds of thousands of recoveries as well. In terms of supplies, equipment, and beds available, many hospitals have become better prepared to help coronavirus patients. But just as their numbers aren't spread evenly across the country, state plans differ as well. I'm Ryan Young outside Columbus, Ohio, and here the state hasn't seen 14 straight days of drop off when it comes to coronavirus cases like the CDC recommends before opening businesses back up. But that hasn't stopped the state from allowing retail shops to open their doors. It's been a tough seven weeks. Some businesses like this one haven't had their doors open. They've had to lay off employees. So this was a welcome open. You can see social distancing markings all across the floor here to be ready for customers. They also have hand sanitizing stations. This doesn't stop just here. Across the state, they're getting ready for more openings. On Friday, we know restaurants will be allowed to do outdoor seating, barbershops, spas, and salons will be able to open. I'm Diane Gallagher in Atlanta. Wholesale beef prices have hit the highest levels ever recorded, according to the USDA. And as the country reopens, meaning restaurants are too, an already struggling industry is now facing new challenges. A barbecue owner in Tennessee tells us that he's leaving brisket off the menu this week because it's just too expensive, much to the disappointment of his customers. At a burger bar in Virginia, the owner tells us that he can only last about one more week with the price of ground beef before he's going to have to increase prices for his customers. He said that every time he sees a light at the end of the tunnel, it seems to go out. I'm Paula Newton in Ottawa, where Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says stronger measures may be needed at the U.S.-Canada border going forward. Now, he says this because as states begin to reopen, he says Canada needs to show extreme caution given the level of outbreak in the United States. Right now, by mutual agreement, that U.S.-Canada border remains closed to all non-essential traffic until May 21st. Both countries are trying to decide whether or not to lift those restrictions, but if they do, there could be temperature checks and medical history checks for those coming into Canada. I'm Erica Hill in New York, where the Broadway League has announced theaters in this city will remain closed through at least September 6th. This impacts 31 Broadway productions. Eight of those were new shows in development. Broadway theaters shut down on March 12th after an usher for two shows tested positive for the virus. As for the city itself, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio says we are still weeks away from reopening. The first chance to look at doing something differently would come in June, but only if there are indicators of consistent progress. What could possibly go wrong? Man, two. Three, two, one. Pass up! No! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we had a jet already. <laughs> four, five centimeters going. Oh, no! <laughs> oh, wow. That is so awesome. Don't get too close. Are you ready to move back? Yep. Okay. Here it comes. 
Oh. Houston, we have a sly bub. Okay, it's well done. It is a perfect sphere. I think we should keep our little friend the slime ball around. Yeah, we should get the name. We just need to have a slime sitter. Someone to watch it, care for it. 10 second trivia. What was the only U.S. battleship to get underway during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941? USS California, West Virginia, Nevada, or Oklahoma? The USS Nevada was the only battleship to start moving, though it was hit by a torpedo and multiple bombs. That's why the crew intentionally ran the USS Nevada aground to save the ship. But its survival is only part of the reason why this was known as the unsinkable battleship. The USS Nevada was commissioned in 1916 and served in World War I. After the Pearl Harbor attack more than two decades later, the ship was repaired and sailed to Europe where it took part in the D-Day landings of World War II. Then the Nevada returned to service in the Pacific. After the war ended, the ship was used as a target in the U.S. military's nuclear weapon testing program. That's when the Nevada survived two atomic blasts in 1946. Still floating, the Nevada was finally sunk in 1948 after the Navy used it again for target practice and hit it with an aerial torpedo. This is the ship's wreckage that was recently located about 65 miles southwest of Hawaii at a depth of more than 15,000 feet. Ocean Infinity, the company that explored the Nevada, says it hopes the ship's story honors those who served in the Navy, plays a role in education, and exists as a symbol of perseverance and courage. You high school seniors are a symbol of perseverance and courage. In so many cases, you've had to trade events like prom, senior trips, and graduation ceremonies in front of families and friends for virtual graduations and a lot of social distancing. Probably not the trade you would have chosen, but you are part of the first class in history to experience a senior year like this, and people are finding ways to have fun with virtual events. Lucky me, I always have my blurry old graduation photos oblivious to social distancing, tickling a fellow grad with a tassel. But now, what a hassle. Class of 2020, what is up? You a pandemic is what's up. Instead of caps tossed and celebrations on stage, flesh and blood grads are being replaced. Emily Kristen Allen. By pictures, you barely have to get dressed for a commencement address. I'm at home, you're at home. Pharrell Williams once sang, Happiness is but now graduates have to be happy with a video commencement. The most famous celebrity to suffer from the virus told grads at Ohio's Wright State. You started in the olden times and the world back before the great pandemic of 2020. You have finished Wright State during well, the great reset. But leave it to Oprah appearing on John Krasinski's Some Good News to find the literal silver lining in a dark cloud. When it's really dark and dreary on the ground and then you get in the plane and within three minutes you shoot above the clouds and you see the sun was always there. Now if only we get up the nerve to fly again. Genie Mose. Good luck. CNN. Good luck. Good luck. New York. So with all the pomp that circumstances permit, when it comes to the class of 2020's commencement, there's no sweating in the sun nor live cheering from a crowd, but history's being made and your families are still proud. So with caps and gowns down, but computer screens flipped up, we wish you all congrats and more than virtual luck. God bless the class of 2020. This show goes out to South Milwaukee High School. It's in South Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We thank you for watching today and hope you'll continue to watch through the end of our season on May 29th. I'm Carl Azus for CNN.